I'm uh, Sina Fazel. I'm a Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellow in Clinical Science based at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Oxford. I'm going to talk a little bit today about a paper that was published in The Lancet last year, in the middle of last year, um, which is a, a systematic review on the global prevalence of intimate partner homicide. So these are homicides which are perpetrated by partners, either former partners or current partners, and um, this is a nice study that was uh, involved a group across the WHO and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, also a couple of collaborators, one in South Africa and one based in, in Baltimore. Um, and what they did is they tried to collect all the information about what's the prevalence of the, these forms of homicide, so the intimate forms of homicide. I think what's interesting about the study is that um, it's actually the methods, because what they do is, um, unlike traditional systematic reviews, which are mostly drawn from peer-reviewed publications, a lot of their work, and I think the, really the added value of the study is they go quite strongly into the grey literature, so the literature that's outside of peer-reviewed journals, and they look quite hard at government reports, websites, they contact uh, Ministry of Justice or equivalent departments, um, they speak to experts in the fields, and I think this is very interesting as sort of methods point, that if you're going to do a review, particularly in an area where there's a lot of routinely collected information, you have to go, you have to look quite hard outside of the traditional uh, indices, uh, indexes rather, and you need to look um, at government reports, official statistics, and then delve even further through email and other forms of correspondence. And I think that's the really nice thing about the papers, that it, it, from a methods point of view, it, it goes the extra mile, I think it really adds a lot of value. So they've actually captured data from a very wide number of countries, I think it's 66, um, and they've looked at, they've got data in different years, and they've used a quality algorithm to um, uh, report on the data that they think is either the most complete or the most recent, and they have a way that's transparent about how they've done that. So I think this is really the strong point about the paper. The other really strong point about the paper, and why it's published in somewhere like The Lancet, not only the sort of methodological strengths of the paper, but also I think it's the importance of the topic, because this is, a, this is um, uh, homicide affects about half a million people. Um, has major impact uh, beyond just deaths on society, economic, social, psychiatric, psychological, um, and, and for health services, who have to often uh, pick up the pieces, particularly where there's uh, attempted homicides, but also on victims um, and family members who um, suffer all sorts of other consequences. Um, so I think that's the other thing to, uh, that I think it highlights is, is that important, you know, this is an important topic and hence it deserves very wide readership. It has, um, I think, implications not just for um, health services, but it has implications for criminal justice services, for public health, public policy. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've attracted to a good journal like The Lancet, that it, it, it works not just across different specialties of medicine, but it works across different, you know, domains in, in public policy, public health, criminal justice, criminology. Um, so I think that, that it's, I think it's a very interesting paper on, on different levels, and there are two ones that I would highlight. Um, one of the things, uh, in terms of the findings of the paper, um, what it does is it reports a proportion of the overall homicides, which are intimate partner homicides, and it does it separately for men and women. And what it finds is that um, in women, around 39% of the homicides are perpetrated by intimate partners, and for men, it's around 6% um, uh, of the homicides are perpetrated by their, their partners. And then what it does is it looks at regional differences, and these are big regions, so Asia, Europe, the Americas, 
and it finds some differences by region. And I think this is where the paper, the findings become interesting because it would be important to understand why those differences exist. Um, they suggest that the, one of the explanations for the differences is that in countries with low overall homicide rates, you're going to get, um, it is one of the explanations for the differences. So in countries with low overall, overall homicide rates, you have a higher rate of intimate partner homicide. And so, um, for instance, in countries uh, in Asia, there was quite a high proportion of intimate partner homicide. And those proportions, there was some variation. And as I say, one of the explanations they present is to do with the, um, the overall rate of homicide. The other explanation would be data quality. So basically, it's something to do with the completeness of the data, the quality of the reporting of the data, um, and that these differences are sort of artifactual because of the differences of the data. The other highlight in terms of their findings, overall findings, is there's a lot of gaps. So there's huge areas of the world where there isn't this sort of information, and that's another important point that they raise, is big gaps, particularly in, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, there's very little information, and there's a nice graph of the world where you can look at the um, overall uh, rates of intimate partner homicide, and you can see the countries where there's no information. So there's lots of the Middle East, there isn't information, and also uh, Southeast Asia, there isn't information, and large parts of Africa, some parts of um, Central America and the Caribbean. And so in a way, it's a challenge for those countries um, to improve their surveillance of this, and, um, and, and I think that's one of the other main findings, is that this is a, there is a challenge, global health challenge, to import, report surveillance. I think one of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't really look any more detail at the sources of variation. And I think in, in these sorts of meta-analyses of observational data, I mean, that's really important, so that the summary statistic doesn't really tell you a lot, because it might purely be, um, you know, um, there might be a lot of variation around this summary statistic. And actually what you want to do is see what are the explanations for the, the differences. And, and what they do is they look at regions, but they don't go anything beyond that. And the sort of things I thought about were, you know, is it something to do with alcohol consumption in those countries? Is it something to do with the status of women? Is it something to do with the education of women? Is it something to do with the availability of certain forms of health services? Um, um, and I think, and, and the final thing would be something to do with me, uh, the mental health of, of homicide perpetrators and victims. So is there some interaction or some explanation, mediation, uh, that would partly explain the variation? Um, so for instance, you can imagine that in, in some, um, in, in some people are more vulnerable to being victims of homicide, and that may explain some of the differences in these countries. But they didn't look at that, and that would be really an important next step. And in a way, this paper presents a sort of overall picture, that, but the, the, the more detailed information to, to explain the variation, the big variation here, is really the next, is a very important next step. And, um, and, and I was left with these questions really in my mind about, you know, what does this really mean? We have an overall number, and we have some differences by these countries, but is there anything else that, that really can explain these differences? And, um, I was left with those questions. From, in terms of clinical implications, um, the paper doesn't really talk a lot about clinical implications. Um, and I think, um, again, it raises a lot of questions. They touch on the fact that uh, risk assessment could be improved. Um, and that's an easy thing to say, but I think in practice, and I think people who work in clinical services will realise that to do decent risk assessments in these very, very rare outcomes, is uh, it's a great challenge. And so although one can say risk assessment needs to be improved, I think um, how to improve it is, uh, it, it's a big, is a big question. And whether actually that is the, that is the right approach in, in of itself is a question. It may not be about improving risk assessment. It may be about other things that health services can respond to. Um, and one of the things, of course, being a psychiatrist that I would think about would be looking at um, people with mental illness, and these are very possibly very high risk, vulnerable population, and actually providing them you know, a targeted intervention at this high risk group might actually be a more meaningful clinical implication than saying improving risk assessment, where you, know, you have 
thousands of people may be attending accident and emergency and actually providing risk assessments for them isn't practical, feasible, or actually very predictive. Um, so I, I wasn't very, um, um, you know, again, I had a lot of questions about the clinical implications that come, came out of the data. Um, they, um, and I think, you know, from a research perspective, they, there are other things people could, you know, research could do to look at um, the sources of variation, um, and I think specifically looking at the, the, the relevance of mental health and alcohol in particular would be important. Um, so overall, a very interesting paper, I think very interesting methodologically mainly, and I think a very important paper in terms of challenging these countries without good surveillance systems to improve the quality of the data they, they have. And also challenging countries that do provide data to keep that up, you know, to continue putting resources into having data, because that's the only way we can track changes, we can look at interventions ultimately, and then do better quality research on what, are, what explains differences within a country over time between countries.